Um, I'm the manager of education and visitor experience here at the Dorsky Museum. We are very, very uh, uh, excited to be joined today by uh, the curators uh, of the exhibition uh, Dos Mundos, Reconstructing Narratives, uh, Stephanie Lindquist and Juanita Lonzo, and also equally as excited to have three artists in the exhibition, Aaron Turner, Erica Murillo, and Antonio Pulgrin. Um, I am not going to talk much because you're here really for uh, Stephanie, Juanito, <coughs> Aaron, Erica, and Antonio. So welcome, y'all. Let's, uh, I'm going to mute myself and um, yeah. Welcome. Um, Juanita, should we share the slides? Begin with that. So yeah. I'm myself and I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to then do the, ah, uh, you can see all my tabs. My apologies, let me go like this. Oh my God, oops, did I forget how to do this? Okay, I think if you go to um, view. Yeah, maybe view. Okay, view, and then I go on, the first one. Full screen. Wait. You hit the, I would go there's back. a play button in the top right or left hand corner. Okay. Oh, I appreciate that. Wait, hold on one second. Oh, no, I did this wrong. Maybe refresh the page, Juanita. Refresh the page. Okay. Or not. Oh, no, what happened? And then it's turning, and then it has a play button, you told me, right? Okay, yeah. let me stop sharing. So then, <laughs> yeah. listen, you go, you need to escape out of full screen, go back into view, and at the top of the view um, uh, uh, menu, it says present. Oh, I see that. Thank you so much. Okay, beautiful. How's that? You're not, you gotta share again. Oh, I gotta share again? Okay, hold on. Okay. Hold on one second. Okay, I'm gonna share. And then I'm gonna go back to this. And then I'm gonna go like this. Come on. My excuse is that I'm not working on my computer. <laughs> okay, how's that? That looks great. great. Okay, very good. I'll go and I'll mute myself. Yeah, I'm gonna go to the first slide. Don't, don't mute yourself, Juanita. Go to the first slide. Oh, okay, go to the first slide. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so welcome everybody. Um, I'm Stephanie Lindquist, one of two co-curators with Juanita Lanzo. Um, and we're so glad to be joined by our three of 12 artists today, Erica Morillo, Antonio Pulgarin, and Aaron Turner. And we'd also like to share, um, you know, our gratitude to Enfoco um, for producing the exhibition and to the Samuel Dorsky Museum for exhibiting it. And I should say that this exhibition is traveling. So this is the first of four um, museums that are part of uh, the State University of New York system. Um, the second uh, exhibit will be at SUNY Fredonia and then at Binghamton and then lastly at Stony Brook. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide and I'll turn it to Juanita to introduce yourself. Okay. So, um, Stephanie and I, um, so this uh, Dos Mundos uh, Reconstructing Narratives is produced by Enfoco. Enfoco Inc. is a nonprofit that supports contemporary, primarily US based photographers of African, Asian, Latino, Native American, and Pacific um, Islander heritage. It was created or founded in 1974. And um, they make their work visible to the art world. You know what? Let me, I'm just going to paraphrase it saying that it provides uh, opportunities for photographers of color through exhibitions, workshops, and their publication, Nueva Luz, which um, it's, um, it, it, it's um, launched, released, or published two times a year. Uh, one of the issues um, highlights the work of the fellows uh, from, from the Enfoco uh, Photography Fellowship, and the other ones are artists, and sometimes, and many of the times, it revolves around a uh, specific theme. Uh, I'm gonna go to the next slide. And they're really beautiful publications. Oh, you have a catalog there. Yeah, so I encourage you to go to the uh, Enfoco website and get your hands on one. Really, really beautiful. 
Um, and I believe it's, it's the oldest and really one of a kind um, publication for photographers of color in the US. So it's really just like an indispensable resource for mm -hmm. getting, your, you know, getting a sense of getting a pulse of like what are photographers of color doing right now. Um, the fellowship, I encourage you to share this information with photographers of color that you know. It is for photographers based in New York State, anywhere in New York State. Um, the upcoming deadline is on December 19th and they award 10 fellowships. Um, each fellow receives $1,000. And I think as Juanita said, the fellows receive, um, they're a part of an exhibition and they get to be in a Nueva Luz publication. Mm -hmm. They also receive some professional development support um, mm -hmm. and of course networking opportunities. And I believe Juanita is gonna speak to us about a very new opportunity that Enfoco um, just received grants for. Yeah, so um, another residency or another way that Enfoco engages photographers of color in the state of New York is through their uh, Media Works in Progress uh, fund um, by the letter SWIP. The deadline is January 11, 2021, so I encourage you to apply. The link to access this application is on the Enfoco website. And this is a uh, residency that uh, for photographers that expand their practice using media um, technologies, um, digital work, uh, video, um, new media. Uh, I'm trying to, to read this, but this is actually on my, um, I can't read the, um, up the, the, I have the bar on my, on top of the text but what i wanted to say is that this um application is an extension to um, media work video sound um in addition to photography so please check out this opportunity and uh for more information you can contact grants at enfoco.org um without delaying our presentation i'm going to move quickly to uh, some of the links um for more information about enfoco uh, the traveling exhibitions, the programs Nueva Luz, and the fellowship. So these are links. I can include this later on the chat uh, for you to have. And then um, I'm going to move to the slide about uh, the exhibition. So I'm going to um, have Stephanie do the uh, introduction. So I just put the links in the chat. Um, so I encourage you to check those out. Um, so this exhibition, um, Dos Mundos Reconstructing Narratives, was originally inspired um, from an earlier iteration of Dos Mundos featuring Puerto Rican artists um, from the island and in New York. Um, as Enfoco has involved, um, Juanita and I approached this theme, um, you know, from a 2019-2020 perspective. Um, so we're featuring uh, really diverse artists of color, and we wanted to focus on these stories that aren't necessarily um, the stories that are like on the fringe of our attention that we're not necessarily thinking about every day. Um, so we have like, for instance, um, Cynthia um, Briona Santos, who's documenting those living in sanctuary. Um, or we have, uh, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on the name. <laughs> Can, um, well, let me do not Asia Harris, but documenting Cuban punks. Or we have Anthony Hambusi, who's really thinking about um, the structure of racism and the underserved and over-policed community in Coney Island. Um, or we have Leila Bahrain Amatula, who's really documenting the diversity within the Black Muslim women community from um, the continent of Africa through the US, um, to give you a sense of the variety of, of artists in the show. And so today we are, and Juanita can show some of the images, um, we're really grateful to have Erica Murillo with us, whose work we're looking at right now, um, as well as, and I should say, so we asked the artist, and Antonio Pulgarin, we asked the artist to include three additional images that weren't in the show, and we're also featuring, and then Aaron Turner's work, and we're also featuring the three works that are in the exhibition. We just wanted to have a little bit more of an expansive conversation today. Um, and these works are related to or belonging to the same series 
of work that we're showing. Uh, so to kind of just jump into the questions, um, part of the reason why we wanted to speak to you, Aaron, Erica, and Antonio all together is that we did see that you have um, some things in common. Each of you are, I would say, complicating these ideas of like, there being any like monolithic identity. So whether that's with your work, Aaron, you're challenging notions of like a monolithic blackness or with your work, Antonio, um, thinking about masculinity or with your work, Erica, and complicating what um, womanhood or motherhood looks like. So I'd like to jump in and just ask each of you um, to speak about how has identity informed your work? And any of you can take it. And we can also go back to the images um, if, you know, to, to really zone in, zoom in on one. Sure. I'm going to share my screen again. And I'm going to go quickly through them. And um... Erica, did you want to jump in? Yeah, maybe I'll start um, by saying something. It's funny because when I was exhibiting this work in Portland in December, I had a solo show there at Blue Sky Gallery and we had an artist talk and someone asked me if me being Dominican or if me being, you know, a woman of color has anything to do with this work. And I said, you know, not really. It's really not about that. You know, it's, it's about something else. Like it's really about motherhood, you know, besides identity. But actually I think the question at that moment caught me off guard because I really hadn't looked at my work from that lens. And just as I have been, you know, working with um, a photo book that I did of, of this work and kind of like understanding how very little uh, female Caribbean voices are in photo books at the moment or in publishing photography work in printed matter, I started to understand that the work, although the concept itself um, maybe does not have to do with me being a woman of color, putting the work out there, which is also part of, you know, being an artist and being in conversation has everything to do with that. And it's a, a, a very crucial part, I think, of my practice at the moment, you know, I'm very invested in um, a, taking an intent look at my experiences. And I think in the Caribbean, we have a problematic uh, relationship with examining our experience, uh, especially in the context of, you know, photography or motherhood, you know, challenging these notions of family, that family is sacred and, and all these things, you know, uh, that family is the pillar or that we're supposed to be, you know, all the time happy or, um, you know, so I think in my work, identity plays uh, in that way. Um, in the fact that I am committed to uh, trying to expand that dialogue in the Caribbean and expand the dialogue on motherhood and also challenge our very um, kind of traditional notions of what family is and how it should be experienced. Antonio, I'm curious how... Um... How does identity inform your work? I'm thinking maybe of moving from the Caribbean to South America and your experience and thinking about Latinx narratives in the US. Oh, you have to unmute Antonio. Sorry about that. So you would think after like a good year of Zoom, I'd, I'd be an expert at this, at this point. <laughs> um, for me, I think identity um, plays a very crucial role uh, in my work. To build a little bit on what Erica said, for me, it's um, learning this in my practice that um, my existence is um, a rebellious call, you know, that me existing as a Latinx queer individual, um, the ter even embracing the term Latinx, which is still something that's in our communities in contention, right? You have traditionalists that are very much against the X in a term that um because they don't want to understand because it, a lot of their mentalities and their their identity their ideologies are built on sort of these archaic principles of identity and masculinity and like 
um, what is expected from our community and us as a culture. Um, so the term X, you know, the, 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 the term Latin X, um, which is used to be inclusive of those um, from the queer spectrum, um, it's interesting that there's so much contention to the term. There's also um, a historical component to that, um, but I haven't seen anyone in our community come up with a better term. So, but um, but it's interesting to see uh, how people fight against in our community against a term that's supposed to sort of bring us closer together. Um, so I think a lot of my work, I'm thinking about sort of dissecting these older ideologies that I grew up with. Um, not to say that um, I have a negative standpoint on everything Latinx culture. It's just there's certain perspectives that I feel like are outdated. And I look at machismo culture in particular, and that's really what my, this particular body of work, Fragments of the Masculine, really hones in on, um, is my relationship with um, these men that I only really knew through archival imagery. Um, um, they happen to be my uncle my um and my biological father um the project eventually evolved into sort of a second chapter where i talked about my relationship with um, my stepfather um who's dominican and i've i have ties to dominican culture um through him um and sort of this idea of displacement right like being um someone who's latinx and queer growing up in the states but having ties to colombian cultures and um but growing up traveling mostly to the Dominican Republic when I was a young kid um, and even in my early adult years like um, knowing that I'm traveling there and and, and feeling like an outsider and an insider um, because identifying with Latino culture um, but also uh, feeling like this is a culture that I wasn't too familiar with I mean for example I can I always look back to the story is like the first time I went to DR, you know, I, and I grew up with um, the Colombian version of arepa, which is like a corn cake with cheese and salt. It's a very salty dish in Colombia, the way Colombia makes it. Um, and then I went to DR and like, you know, I was, I was first time as a kid, I'm getting used to the foods, um, the taste, the smells, the just, you know, la cultura. And I, my my dad was like, all right, like as a as a way to like make me happy, he was like, we have arepa for you today. And I was so excited. Um, and then they bring out this thing that looks like a cake, and I was and they were like, here's arepa, here's the arepa, and I was like, that's not an arepa. He's like, yeah, this is our version of arepa, and it was sweet. And I was like, oh, and like it's it's a little moment like that, but sort of looking at um, the threads that that bind us together and the things that also uh, make us culturally different and rich and in, in so many ways. Um, so I take those experiences and I think that that really informs my work is coming from these different places. Um, and I think um, as a being Latinx and being queer, it's like it, 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 they feel like two contradicting perspectives that, uh, at least I always felt like they felt like two contradicting perspectives that, that, that weren't meant to coexist. That's how I always felt growing up and sort of resolving that through these, um, through this archive and, and making this work was really something that started out as therapeutic and was, you know, really more about me and my identity. And I realized as the process went further um, that it was really about sort of an, um, speaking on identity and, and a culture that's uh, been prominent um, within our communities, and and it, you know, and there's people of color that resonate with this work. I've gotten messages um, from people all over the world that um, that resonate with the theme of this work. Um, people of color from all over the world. So that's been really great. Because um, I'm not going to sit here and say that I made the work to to change the world. You know, I'm not going to spin you some narrative like that. Um, it was very much. An, it came from a narcissistic place of wanting to 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 you know deal with something in a therapeutic means and for me art creating art is therapeutic and um but at the end of the process i saw that it it could serve a greater good 
you know, in terms of speaking on things. Like if I could share my story, that it could resonate with others. So I'm happy that it has. Um, but it was a process. But yes, my work is very much centered on um, the notions of identity and the complexities of identity and the, the, the different layers that make, make identity up. So. And Aaron, one thing Antonio brought up um, was working with the archive and knowing people through the archive. And I think of your work and the archival imagery that you work with um, and identity kind of being like a conceptual foundation of your work. So I'd love to hear you speak to how you think about identity in, in your work. Yeah, it's, it's a complicated uh, answer because there's so many layers um, to add to what uh, uh, Eric and Antonio just, just expressed. You know, I know when you all were probably working in the studio and creating your work, it's just, it's just all these ideas just spinning in your head and, you know, it's a lifelong thing. It never really stops. So um, identity plays an important role in my work. But when I first started out in photography, um, I necessarily didn't have the understanding of, of, of representation or anything like that. It was just, you, you, you take this first class, they present this history of photo book, and you just kind of go with it. And it wasn't until after I finished undergrad that I started being exposed to photographers like Gordon Parks and Gordé Carava. And then I started to move throughout the other uh, various diasporas of people of color. Um, and then it just shows you how, how they were left out of the narrative. Um, and then things like that is what keeps me in the past and keep me engaged with the archive because even everything that we're dealing with today, there's some version of that that has happened in the past. Uh, and I'm always looking for those signifiers in the past because I'm like, that something was missed there. Um, something was overlooked. Um, not enough attention was paid to this, to this archive or, or this representational um, historical event through imagery um, because it's repeated itself uh, many times over. So that's how I engage with um, identity and, and representation in my work. Um, my work, Black Alchemy, is kind of like a lens. It's kind of like a vehicle to interpret things um, as an artist working in the studio with my own thoughts, um, navigating my own childhood, navigating my own life experiences, and then how that um, kind of crosses paths with everyone else that I come into contact with um, along the way. So it's just a, it's a long, lifelong continuing conversation about identity because that you know on a personal level um, I love geometric abstraction I love to follow light um, I love uh, beautiful landscapes uh, but I can't uh, escape out of my skin um, I cannot forget my um, my heritage uh, I can't forget my parents I can't forget my grandparents and the things that they shared with me the things that they've lived through and so that's why the archive continues to creep into my work because I've tried to just go in the studio and um, photograph, um, you know, a beautifully lit object uh, without putting an image of Martin Luther King in there. And I just can't do it. It, it, it won't leave me alone. So uh, that's why my work looks the way that it does and how identity plays into it. Juanita, do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, so I'm going to go back to, um, maybe I'm just going to start with Erica with this question um, about symbolism in your work. So what are some of the um, symbols um, you use in your work, Erica? Um, and I can be more specific, but I'm just going to um, let you answer that first part and I may do some um, follow-up questions. Okay, first of all, I want to apologize because you will hear like bang, really loud banging because they're doing construction. So you might hear some of that in a little bit. Um, it's weird. And I always love being in conversation with other artists and seeing how they create. Um, like, for example, with Antonio and Aaron, um, I'm really fascinated about the work that comes from looking at an archive and then thinking conceptually how you can interpret it. And, um, but when I was making this work, which is kind of like my first um, cohesive and big project, it was like the complete opposite. I never had an idea a priori 
that I was carrying out, it was only when um, I started to look at the images that I saw kind of like connecting threads. I, there's the banging. Sorry, <laughs> it's bad. Um, you know, I, I kind of like never set out to make a specific image. I just see what I find when I am uh, making the work. So in documenting my son, this work was a lot about really being present in the moment as a single mom. You know, I was conflicted with becoming a single mother so young. So I think photography allowed me to be present in that experience and investigate it. And then after I had amassed years of photographs, I started to see connecting threads. One of them was water and was how water in the work came to serve as this kind of either reflecting agent or veil. So for example, here, how in this image, you know, he's like in another kind of work. For me, like um, a lot of this has to do with uh, entering a dreamscape. Um, so, you know, in my work, water serves as this kind of like portal to enter a dreamscape or in the other image that is there, the past dissolves where there's like a curtain of water in another reality that my son is about to enter. Um, I also see that as a kind of visual element that I use in my work, uh, to express my feelings. Um, another thing is gesture. So uh, when I was editing the work, of course I had many portraits of my son, and, but the ones that I chose for this work, most of the ones that I gravitated towards are the ones where he's kind of like in this suspended state. He's either um, with his eyes closed or his eyes are veiled. And for me, this sort of gesture, this suspension, um, I wanted to use it as a, a as a way to represent me wanting him to stay a child and not realize part of the baggage that I bring to my mothering through my family history. There's a lot of trauma in, in my family, which I speak of in my other work, in my photo books and in other projects. But uh, for example, there was a femicide in my family and um, uh, sexual abuse and a lot of things that are very heavy that I've been trying to grapple with in my work and through sort of veiling his gaze, it is me talking about my own fear, I, I find. And of course, this is not something that I created intentionally. It is only after I look at the work after that I realize what my intention is. So, um, that's something very integral to my practice as well. Um, kind of like photography is a way to understand what I'm feeling before I'm conscious of it. I understand it after when I examine my work and my images. Um, and also shadows. These particular pictures don't have like such a high usage of shadows as the other ones in the work. Um, but there are other photos of this body of work where shadows are very present. And for me, I wanted shadows to come, well, I guess in this one, yes. But <laughs> I, I wanted to come and uh, talk about polarities and how as human beings, I, I don't, um, I don't believe in the notion of a human being being completely uh, wholesome. I think we're all dealing with either a darkness or a history or something that is at odds at, at a duality. And to me, motherhood itself was that kind of duality of like, and I had issues with that because I wanted to be like happy mom all the time and oh motherhood is the greatest thing that happened to me but oftentimes it was very tumultuous and you know so with the shadows in the work I'm also trying to express that other part that is not necessarily that um that easy so yeah thank you Erica um I'm, I'm making a note um as you mentioned uh the shadows the reflection of the water um I, I'm you know, just maybe to kind of um, to, as a connecting thread for these works, um, umbral. Um, can you talk a little bit about the symbolism on that word? 
Yeah, um, Umbral, it, it came from the, what I was speaking about before this idea of like suspension, but you know, mm -hmm. umbral, which translates to threshold, mm -hmm. is in between space. And for me, that in between space in the work is him transitioning from childhood to adolescence and what that represents in terms of his innocence, what he knows about me, about his own history. So there's that in that transition, you know, kind of like moving from one age to another. But there's also umbral between, you know, reality as we know it in a dreamscape. Mm -hmm. So to me, in my work, I like to make images that, you know, feel could be part of dreams that could be mm -hmm. like, uh, like what you see when you're in, a, in the haze of a dream. So that umbral represents that for me. And lastly, there, there are many meanings that I associate with it, but another one was that uh, I think uh, as a person, I, I was really, as a kind of alchemy, uh, 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 was really transformed by the experience of motherhood, both in its hardship and its wonder, um, so to me, umbral really represents also what motherhood has been in my life and also in my work. I think I became an artist after I had my kid, which is really paradoxical because I thought when I became a single mama, I'm not going to be able to do, you know, anything significant now. Now I'm going to be only a mother. And it was through that kind of like, uh, that I started to create. And um, yeah. Thank you, Erica. That was great. I want to um, pose the same question with Antonio, but I, I'm going to be, I'm going to tailor that to, to the work. And Antonio, like, um, like with Erica, right, the, the symbolism, and it's interesting because there's a lot of symbolism in, in, the, in, the, in the works of the three of you. Uh, well, with Erica, it's connected to reality versus fantasy, reflections, it's hard edges. Um, I, I want to ask, Antonio, um, about symbolism in your work, and um, just tell me more about symbolism and um, the archival aspect of the work, and how do you see that that plays out? Um, I think throughout my work, I use symbolism in, in various different um, in different different ways. Um, mm -hmm. In this, with this image, it's. Um, which looks more sculptural than anything. It was sort of created as a sculpture. It's um, the hat is um, the the military cap of my um, goth, um, not my goth, but my uncle's got um, military cap from Colombia um, that was left to me. Um, the jacket is my jacket, sort of a jacket for me wearing a leather biker jacket in um, in, in in the village. Um, here in New York City, it's just, just, just like, there's this queer symbolism to that. Um, just in, in the history, um, in the history uh, of sort of like the, the leather scene in, um, but it's also here in like, in, in my perspective, there's a, there's a connection there. So um, it's about really connecting my, my connections to my uncle who, for me is very, very representative of Colombian culture and then tying in my connections to, to queer histories. Um, also, pardon me if I sound a little out of it, I'm a little under the weather, but I'm here, I'm with you. Um, I think also symbolically, I'm also looking at how we consume imagery. Um, mm -hmm. And I've been thinking about this more um, in this quarantine year. Um, I It's interesting, it's, I'm in a show that's about photography. Um, but the term photography or photographer is not something that I identify with as much nowadays. Um, photography itself will always be an important component of, of my process and my practice. But um, I, I feel like I've sort of moved um, away from, and there's nothing wrong with the conventional approach to photography. I don't want it to be misconstrued. Um, I just, see myself moving in different directions. Um, I, Cause I think about how I consumed photography as a kid and I had really sort of this big epiphany moment this year where I was, you know, you, you, you get trained in a way um, when you're showing your photographs and your artwork to want to frame everything. Mm -hmm. And I thought back to the way that I consumed imagery as a kid and imagery was never something I consumed via the frame. It was always something that was, 
um, taped to the fridge or taped to a religious statue or to mm -hmm. a mirror adhered in some way to another surface, but never within the context of this frame. Whenever you did see the frame, a framed image, it was a very sort of like special moment, the way that that image was treated, the fact that it, that there was enough money to put it in a frame, you know, or there was enough thought to put something in a frame. And I really, um, I realized why have I been framing my work um, for so long when it's, you know, so I'm thinking about the different ways that I consume photography or have consumed photography, the, the ways that I then sort of present it um, to an audience. Um, a lot of these photographic collages are now being presented in in different capacities. Um, in this exhibition alone, there are two um, prints on aluminum. Um, I like to talk to that. Yeah, and I believe yeah, it's these two that are printed on aluminum, and I'm playing with sizes in terms of how you interact with the images. Um, there's mm -hmm. only one frame piece representing me in this exhibition, which is this one. Um, and it made sense uh, because of the care and the treatment of how fragile this image, this archival image was. Um, so I'm really thinking about those choices when presenting the work. So there's a lot of symbolism. And of course there's symbolism in the color palette. Um, mm -hmm. I utilize in this particular project, um, the colors of the Colombian flag come through in um, different different tones or shades. Um, so you'll see yellow, red, and blue throughout the project. Um, and that's very common. And then I'm playing with things like, you know, wallpaper vinyls and um, installation, um, using that um, method of, of visual language. Um, I'm also printing on, um, lately I've been printing now on wooden panels, um, on marble, um, and really kind of playing with these ideas of how we um, visually consume um, photographic works or just um, photography and, and collage works in general. So there's a lot of symbolism in my work that goes beyond um, the cultural symbolism, which is there, it's present, um, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm thinking about sort of the medium as well. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the process, but um, before we move into that, I just want to ask this question to Aaron also. And um, the way I'm going to probably tailor it to him is like, um, you know, what are some of the symbols you use in your work? And in particular, um, I'm going to go quickly through the images, Aaron, while you answer that. But I also see... Um, you know, some shadow casting, layering, historical references. I'm going to let you answer the question, but the, the symbolism in your work, the symbols in your work. Yeah, uh, I, I just want to say I love that Antonio um, mentioned, you know, how images are consumed and outside of the frame and how Erica brought up alchemy and, and the duality between these, these ways of existing. It's just like, I'm thinking of uh, similar things, but in, in terms of uh, symbols in, in my work and, and references, I'm sort of always in between these two spaces of trying to understand the um, the trajectory of Black abstract artists from the mm -hmm. 1970s and the 1960s and how mm -hmm. the, the work that they were making were ex excluded from the narrative um, mm -hmm. and, and kind of seen as second rate. But then those, those same artists are receiving a lot of notoriety now. And, and at the same time, they're my contemporaries <laughs> as well as they're still making work. They never deviated um, from abstraction. So be, within being motivated from that, like speaking specifically about the, um, the freedom study number one and freedom study number two uh, images, it's, you know, you have these, uh, in my image, I use these Xerox prints of Martin Luther King, JFK, and Jesus. Or what? Or and I think you know we know that that's not the true um, depiction of Jesus. We don't really know what that depiction is, but it's this sort of this stand-in or image that people believed in from a certain time period and still to today. I grew up seeing that image um, in my grandparents' uh, house. 
uh, grew up seeing that image uh, at the church I went to or different churches I would visit uh, growing up in the Arkansas Delta. And so, but this, this piece is in direct conversation with the, with the painting from uh, the artist Kerry James Marshall. And it's from this series of works he calls Mementos. Um, and, and, and it's in conversation with this piece uh, titled We Mourn Our Loss, number one, from 1997. And he goes on years after that to make, you know, I think eventually eight of these uh, memento pieces. And sort of what, what he's dealing with is like, um, he was looking at commemorative banners that were present in African-American households like in the late 1960s and 1970s following these assassinations of people like Martin Luther King and JFK. I mean, the images are on plates, um, posters, handouts. I remember seeing MLK church fans uh, growing up, um, bookmarkings for Bibles and all that kind of stuff with uh, historical figures on them. And so it's, it's, that sort of comes out of like the three uh, individuals pictured in these Xerox prints, you know, they all had this belief of, of serving the disenfranchised and it, and it fuels their status because they all uh, are martyrs uh, to their specific cause. And so there's multiple layers of interpretations, meanings, and values to that um, of the nature of uh, commemoration. Mm -hmm. And my, my image is trying to decontextualize or transform that, just add to the conversation. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, and then also going back to abstraction and then the different lines and stuff that you see, that's kind of like the visual pleasure of the geometric forms. And, you know, one image is more decorative than the other. So... So like Antonio was talking about the frames, like, you know, I would grow up seeing these images in frames or adorned in, in a poster, you know, there may be glitter or like gold leaf and things like that, where I'm just taking these images and uh, pinning them to a wall on Xerox paper um, from a copier. Um, but the way that I decorate the frame is, is, is through geometric abstraction or, or, or some form of abstraction of light. And so, um, to sort of round out the symbology in that, it, it, it just takes another look. It, it's not simply, you know, looking at these horrific events themselves or the loss of life, you know, political implications or historical impacts. Uh, the ideal of a martyr or being, a, or being martyred, um, but it's, it's, it's an act of remembering. It's, it's an act of continuing um, remembering. Um, how do we remember things uh, from childhood? How do we commemorate? Um, and, and also uh, the figures from Freedom Study 1 and 2, there's different combinations and versions of that depending on the culture you grow up in or the culture you're from. It's going to look different in an Irish household. It's going to look different in a Dominican household. It's going to look different in a Native American household. So um, it's, it's kind of like a puzzle where you can interchange and pull out different pieces. Carrie James Marshall piece. Uh, doesn't include Jesus. His includes um, uh, Martin Luther King, Robert F. Kennedy, and John F. Kennedy. Mm. Um, so that's his version. Uh, I didn't put uh, Robert F. Kennedy in my work because I just didn't grow up hearing about Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, mine were more so the figures that are present um, in my work. So that's a little bit of, of uh, you know, how I deal with symbology um, in my work. Um, speaking from from that that those that dipped it uh, so to speak um, yeah okay so just to kind of um these questions connect and some of you already dwelt into into um into this territory by speaking so i'm just going to go back to erica's images because i want to touch a little bit on again another element that i see that relates but relates differently and it's about the way you manipulate your photo meaning the way the the, the, the object into itself, that photography, the layers that I see. And some of these layers are uh, physical layers that have been photographed is the way you frame your photos, um, your composition, the way that, um, and you know, it's interesting that uh, all three of you use the word archival and archives, uh, which I find fascinating because I was thinking, oh yeah, and it's funny, um, you know, we don't think as these accumulation of images uh, and memories as, um, you just archive the memories um, in your work, all three of you. So Erica, I want to hear more about um, the way um, your photos are manipulated. I'm, I'm thinking of the way the images are framed, 
the source seeing uh, the reflections, what seems to be real and what seems to be more like um, fantasy. So I'm gonna start with Erika, then move to um, Antonio and then to Aaron. Um, well, with this, like, um, when I photograph, one of the things that I really enjoy is being really, really close to the subject. Like, I always photograph, like, with a fixed lens or with my phone or whatever I have at hand, but I like to be very close. And, um, you know, sometimes I... I don't look at the subject directly, but through something else or something in the middle or through water. Let me see, I'm trying to see if, they, if I have um, uh, one of my books here that I can show you an image, but I have like a couple of images of my son where you know I'm seeing him through a window or through a, a, a car or through something else. And I really enjoy in the image to have different layers. This one particularly here are, the frame is not as chaotic. These are actually from the work, the ones that are like cleanest. But I'm, I think I'm very influenced by uh, New York City street photographers, you know, how, you know, this energy in the frame, which is why I like to shoot more like wider, images to kind of see how the frame can be dynamic and have different elements to it. Um, let me show you really quickly here. Uh, I have, sorry, um, I have this uh, dummy that I did of uh, my work umbral. Mm -hmm. um, can you see my camera? And maybe I show you a photo of what I mean in terms of the, a, uh, Juanita, can we maybe end the screen share? Sure. I'm just going to stop the um, screen sharing so then we can, and then I'm going to pin, I'm going to do speaker view for Erica. Yeah, so for example, in this, in this image I have here, which mm -hmm. is like my kid, uh, you know, the forefront is uh, the bloom and the flower and he's kind of like in the back, like in, in the framing of my work, I really like this element of having other things, other things complicate the frame. Um, or for example, this one, oh, yeah. where it's a self-portrait, but he's also there. Um, and I like this kind of like dynamic aspect in the image where you're not looking at something concretely, although I, I do have images like that. But this, I think this particular one is what I was alluding to in terms of like the energy of like mm -hmm. street photography. Let me see if you guys can see it here. Oh, yeah. So this is one of the images of my kid in Coney Island. And when I print this image big, you know, I'm just fascinated by all the people in the back. There's a lady that is pregnant. There's the Ferris wheel. There's like a, a mom or a grandmom with three kids and like running to one side. And like this sort of like dynamic aspect is something I enjoy in photography um, mm -hmm. to kind of like zoom in with my feet to get close. Um, and right now I'm trying to, in my present projects, I'm trying to divert from that because I'm not shooting as much and working more from archive. And mm -hmm. how can you find that dynamic aspect in the imagery when you're not, you know, shooting? Um, so for example, with Antonio's work in his image that is ripped or, you know, in Aaron's work where you have this other layer of like dust underneath, it's very inspiring to see how you can, um, layer an image, not with framing, but with materials as well. Um, so yeah. Erica, in, in thinking about the form, can you also, you provide your viewer with a really intimate experience with the artist book. Can you talk about um, your decision to present your work in artist books? Yeah, let me see. I have here uh, the book I did for Umbral. So let me just show you really quickly, like, as I mentioned, for me, the I've always been very drawn to books, and I think it had to do a lot with my work. I work at the International Center of Photography in the library, and we see books and books and books, and like 
the way you conceive of a project or an image within a book is completely different than how you see it in a wall yeah. or how you perceive it in one single image. So to me, there has been a shift in my work in trying to get at a reader's experience. Mm -hmm. So for Umbral, what I did was that I did this artist book that is shaped as a kind of letter. It's a mm -hmm. handmade pouch and um, it's a continuation of previous work where I did an uh, um, photo book uh, related to my father, like mm -hmm. my father was killed in a dictatorship in Dominican Republic and his body was never found. And in this previous work, what I did was that I utilized found images to come and fill in the gaps in my memory about my father and I mixed that with the archive. Mm -hmm. uh, with like my family archive. So that was like a way of approaching uh, a history from books that really touched me. And with doing Umbral, I wanted to do a kind of letter to, but different. I wanted to uh, honor this idea of the family album. So when you open it like this, you know, here in the back you have, I wanted it to have the kind of feeling of the family album, you know, how the uh, photos are fastened in the corners. And then the book has a poem that I wrote to my son, which starts um, in the cover and it continues throughout the book as, um, as you page through it. And I just really wanted it to feel like postcard size, like a letter, like something intimate that you receive in the mail. This is one of the images from the book, for example. Um, and then the poem kind of unfolds. Um, oh, wow. Images like this. And then um, there are like, I, I really wanted to, the images in the book to be in conversation. So for example, this is one of the spreads I like the most, which in, on one side is the image we've seen of my son and a kind of self-portrait with him. But I've always found this image kind of a bit morbid. And then uh, this dead bird that I found in the street and kind of like the fragility in motherhood as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the book starts this way. And then when you flip it, you have the same experience, but with the photo edition backwards and the poem also read backwards. So the book itself is a kind of mirror with like two interpretations and, um, it's just a different way of looking at the work. And uh, to me, there is a political element uh, to making work in printed matter, mm -hmm. getting your work to uh, more hands, uh, creating a document of your voice that could be disseminated. And there aren't a lot of women doing photo books or you know, uh, photography focused on family in the Caribbean. And for me, I just want to uh, expand that and um, that's my interest in making books uh, so yeah thank you thank you so much Erica so Antonio um, uh, you know piggybacking on on, on this uh, you know very charged um, you know how family or, or archives uh, relate so much to um, the work that you do all this layering um, and let me know if you want me to uh, share my screen again and if, if, if we're okay just speaking like this. And Stephanie, please feel free to chime in um, to, to segue the, the, the questions. So I'm ready, Antonio. Oh, you're muted, Antonio. I keep forgetting, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> You want me to talk about sort of the elements of family in my work or? Actually, well, you know what? Um, I, I will say yes, um, but also I, let me uh, rephrase the question. So this time I'm thinking of the formal devices that you use to communicate your ideas. And, um, you know, you mentioned archive, um, you mentioned family, the importance of that, but also I'm thinking of that, uh, that textured feeling that I have. Like I literally feel the paper and how the work was composed in your work. So uh, please share um, that with us and let me know if you want me to share the screen and, and go over the images or if, if we can speak uh, just like this. Um, a lot of my process is um, it begins with sort of scanning the archive. Um, and then what I like to do is print it on a lot of um, various surfaces. Um, mm -hmm. So I make a lot of reproduction prints. Um, I'm going to pull the... And 
And so in the process of making those reproduction prints, um, there is a lot of experimenting. There's a lot of ripping and, and tearing and, and, and layering. Um, sometimes I'll make larger collages and mm -hmm. by the time that I recontextualize it through the camera mm -hmm. um, or through a digital lens, um, it, I find that I hone in on, the, on a part that feels like this is the strongest part of, essentially what I do is I crop. I, a lot of the times you'll see me crop the, um, what is like a larger collage into the final composition. Um, and that just has to do with um, a feeling I get once I'm looking through the viewfinder, what I feel works mm -hmm. um, and, and, and what feels strongest and sort of, it's, it's the same approach that I would take when composing an image um, on the field when I did documentary um, work. My earlier work is, it's the same approach. It's just looking at it through a different, um, a different, I don't want to say lenses, but anyway, that sounds so, so punny, but anyway, um, but it, it, it is through a different perspective now. Um, and so a lot of it is just really just experimenting and seeing what works, um, really looking, um, I did prior to starting this work, looking at the pictures generation um, and looking at that era of like, mm -hmm. of art making and, and, and looking at sort of how images were layered and, and, and composed and then and then from there you know i try not to look at a lot of work that's being made now um it's it's i like to just kind of go in there into my process kind of blindly and just play um which i felt like prior to this project i didn't really get a chance to do that um it was i think it had been a while since i just had an opportunity to just play around conceptually um, because I think I got caught up in this very, um, this, you know, I, it's being addressed now in our social political climate, but like prior to this, it got lost in this very sort of toxic cycle of like feeling like I couldn't find my place in the documentary journalistic photo world, right? You know, not getting the gigs. Um, constantly seeing um, my white race thing, you know, where they're, they're going to foreign countries, photographing narratives that don't belong to them, getting paid for it. And, and I just felt very disheartened, you know? Um, and it just, it made me sort of like drift away from um, documentary and portraiture work. Um, and I had this archive sitting there and it, I had, a need to do something with it for a long time. And I sort of just took the opportunity to, to do so and to kind of reinvent and re-examine what my practice would look like. So a lot of these collages are um, an experiment in, in a new process um, for me, new process for me. Um, and I'm working on a new body of work now that I'm like incredibly excited by and, and there's, um, there's been an evolution in how I'm approaching um, these collages and, and, and the patterns and the textiles that I use. And um, mm -hmm. so it's, it's exciting to, s I look at these images now and I s they, they very much represent the foundation of what my work is becoming now. Um, but it's still a nod to um, my love for photography and the way that I compose my work. Um, it's, I took no different approach. Um, I mean, you see in this installation, these are, um, that's a portrait of my stepfather um, of his back and that's a portrait of me in like um, a leather harness, that's my back. So it's like, I'm, you know, I'm not shifting away from photography by any means, but um, it's, it's, it's no longer the only element of my work. Um, so yeah, so I think that, it, but it all started with these photographic collages. Um, and just playing around. Um, the patterns came into play a little later where I, I, I would randomly, I mean, I'm just like a lover of like just floral patterns and, and things of that nature and just, just textiles. And I would just buy like 
it started with me buying like all these random wrapping papers that I knew I would never use. I'm just like so random. I go to paper source in the city or stuff like that. And like, and then one, one of the, this was actually wrapping paper and it reminded me of the emerald, the emeralds in, in Colombia, the yellow, of course, um, and the flag. And I just, and it also reminded me of the tapestries that my mom would use on the tables um, at home when I was growing up, like those little, um, those table mats that she would she would have on this uh, you know every, you know on the living room um, and I just was really sort of like it, it took me back to to memories of home mm -hmm. um, and I so I, I started I realized oh like this this utilizing this pattern makes sense and and I just started collecting more patterns and now I now my apartment's just filled with an assortment of <laughs> patterns and 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 fox leather prints and oh my god, I it's a it's 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 a whole mess. I have to figure out a way to <laughs> to organize it. But um, it just was an experiment to see if that pattern and would fit with this narrative, and and they just slowly but surely started to come together. So Antonio, um, maybe I I neglected to um, to mention this, but the um, the series of works that we're looking at, I'll call. Uh, Fragments of uh, masculinity, right? Um, fragments of the masculine, yeah. Fr fragments of the masculine. Thank you so much. And somehow that title relates to that fragmented and yet kind of way where things are layered and collaged together digitally. So was that something that was intentional that the title came, you know, was that first? Or that came after you look at the work overall and then you saw that it was all these. Uh, you know, layering that it was, met, uh, you know, met, metaphorical and literal in, in the work that you're doing? Um, that came after looking at the works. Like, I, to be honest, when I was making this work, it was like piece by piece. I didn't really know what everything was going to look like because this was mm -hmm. all new territory for me. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until I started sort of making smaller um, work prints and looking at everything as a whole that I was like, wow. And I, and I, I, entertained a few titles but fragments of the masculine kind of like felt there was something poetic about it there was something um that yes of course spoke to the spoke to the physical nature of the works but uh really talked about um dissecting these different elements that make up machismo culture and masculinity um and and really sort of and then there was in some of the other works, there's a use of like um, dialect um, terminology in Spanish in the in the Spanish language that is incorporated into the works. And I really wanted to, you know, incorporate the aspect that I'm bilingual, that I come from a bilingual family, bilingual culture, because um, I think that that's something that very much makes up my identity, and it's an important aspect of my identity. And like, mm -hmm. I wanted to incorporate that because I, I would shy away from um, from Spanish titles um, earlier in my career and I think now I've I've learned to embrace it and like <laughs> you know I'm not I'm not going to translate something for you if I don't feel like it um, it's you know it's look it up um, that may be harsh but I am living my my truth <laughs> as, a, as a Latinx individual and I um, but that that took a lot of sort of resolving, and I think that through this work, I was able to sort of really connect with my inner cultura, my my roots, my connections to my roots, because mm -hmm. that was always sort of something that was very complex for me. Um, I felt as a young age, I didn't belong because I had these other feelings of like, um, what does it mean to be a gay man in this in this culture, and like, does this can can I even belong? So it's taken me a while to embrace just even saying I am a Latinx queer individual. Um, so that has been a process. And I think through this work, I was able to really sort of resolve a lot of that. It's, it was very therapeutic, <laughs> I'll say that. <laughs> Thanks, Antonio. I'm gonna move with this question and tailor it to um, Aaron. And Aaron, if you can speak about the formal devices that you use to communicate your ideas in your work. Um, and take it away. Yeah, I use a lot of different formal devices in my work. I think uh, one of the most important is the, the 4x5 view camera. 
um, because I wouldn't have been able to imagine the spaces that I've created through Black Alchemy without it. Um, and ever since I was introduced to the 4 by 5 camera, like, you know, as an undergraduate, um, you know, maybe my second or third year through my degree, um, I haven't put it down. I, I have a genuine love for that camera. Um, I love the process of setting up the camera. I love looking through the camera. I love the process of developing film afterwards. Um, I love the quality of film. I love to scan the film, but I also like to take it in the dark room and enlarge it um, mm -hmm. onto photo paper um, and explore different textures through that. But I also like to explore materials, mm -hmm. um, kind of like how Antonio was talking about uh, going around collecting all these different papers and patterns and textiles. Um, you know, in my studio now, there's like, like uh, black gesso everywhere, linen tape, uh, black suede black backdrops, plain black paper. There was a uh, core board, masonite, uh, wood, um, different types of paint, acrylic paint, oil stick. Um, and, I'm, and it's all in this monochrome um, color palette of, of like black and white. And then, you know, when you're exposing, um, when I'm exposing the film, you know, you can get the silvers and the grays. Um, and when I mix the paints or mix the patterns or the light interacts with multiple colors in the same space, you know, you start to get these different shades and hues of things. So I'm always trying to work on the sort of the opposite ends of the spectrums. Uh, what, like this photograph, that photograph of the lynching, um, photo, making that photograph, um, you know, making this photograph in a pitch black room mm -hmm. um, with just that light box, you know, and metering it. And it was like, you know, because the camera sees different than we do. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh my goodness, uh, is this thing going to come out? <laughs> and that's the alchemic side of it because I didn't really know how this image was going to come out um, before I developed it. And then I could see the negative and all that good stuff. But um, you know, this this image just started as a, a, a as something as a vision I had in my mind as I was trying to deal with using photography to examine um, the absence of photographic elements because I, I traced this uh, lynching image and it's a whole backstory to it and um, I was looking at the artist Melvin Edwards and his lynching fragments around this time too. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also trying to experiment with, experiment with other mediums at mm -hmm. the time. So drawing and um, tracing and um, charcoal and oil stick. But then those materials would always end up in front of the camera. Um, so that's a little bit about how I use formal um, devices and approaches in my work. And, and in some of the material choices, I'm interested in the ideal of, of reflecting. So just like I was talking about and, and all these archives, how the archive allows us to look back and reflect. Um, mm -hmm. Even in this image here, I'm titled Self, um, a, a literal reflection of myself. I show up in the work. And then you look in the corner, there's the Sydney Fortier work. I'm going to um, you see the, the arrow here. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's often how my studio looks. Um, <laughs> you know, paper is just everywhere. I'm making Xerox prints, I'm making inkjet prints, I'm making darkroom prints, and then I'm taking that and bringing it back in front of the camera. So that's a little bit how my studio operates and um, how I think of things. Like that background there, that's black felt. And mm -hmm. so the light is going to absorb differently, it's going to reflect differently, mm -hmm. um, it's going to act differently um, than it would be if it was just paper or, or suede. Or, or satin or silk uh, material. So uh, I'm very much interested in the materials formally and drawing a certain materials formally, um, just as much as I am the archive. So, uh, Aaron, is this photographic paper or this is um, Xerox paper? It looks- Xerox paper. And, and, and that's a way of like working fast. You know, I have these ideas and I'm like, um, I got to make that image now. Um, 
and I, I, a lot of what I was doing when I was making these pictures in 2018 is, uh, and I can tell the backstory on this one real quick, uh, but this image is uh, Drew King. And um, it, I was uh, Googling and looking through archives for African, African-American men in the Ivy League just to see how they were depicted and represented. Mm-hmm. Um, and Drew King uh, reminded me of myself. It reminded me of several friends that I have had, reminded me of different mentors. He reminds me of my brothers, my cousins, all these different things. But the, the specific backstory is this, this, this crop photo of Drew King is a, it, it's a crop because if, if, uh, if I had the link, I would put it in the chat, but um, the larger picture is from like a yearbook and Drew King is in the Glee Club at Harvard at this time in like 1941, 1943. And he's the only black member. And so with that being said, and with that being the case, his presence in the Glee Club, these Ivy League Glee Clubs used to travel throughout the South and they had to contend with the fact that there was segregation at the point. And so uh, due to Drew King being in the Glee Club, uh, they had to uh, desegregate uh, uh, because they wanted to enjoy these th- this entertainment. They had to accept Drew King um, when they traveled through the South. So he kind of sort of, uh, uh, in a way, had made them contend with desegregating these venues uh, when they uh, traveled throughout the segregated South in, in the 1940s. So um, sometimes I react to the found image because it, it reminds me of, of people um, personally that I interact with. And then I go and find the backstory and see how, how I can learn from that mm-hmm. and, and how other people can learn from that. Um, and just a clarification on Drew King, if you want to look up Drew King is D R uh, E W, not D R U E. Uh, that's a clerical error on my end, just in case somebody <laughs> tries to look it up and they're like, I don't know, this is not true, but it's D-R-E-U. So I've changed the title because, again, I remembered his name, but I forgot how he spelled it. And then I found it again, um, recontextualized it, corrected the title. And it's just all part of, it's all a part of the process. So uh, I, yeah, I, I just want to make that note. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I want to pass the, the mic to, to Stephanie, um, d- just to kind of piggyback of some of the things that, um, you know, how with this connecting thread of, the, of your works with archives, memory, with layers, and the process. Um, so, um, Stephanie, um, I- I'm going to move in to you now, and let me know if you want me to continue to share the screen, or if you want me to like, stop sharing. Yeah, why don't we stick with um, with Aaron's work for the moment? So for this last question, um, I'd like for each of you to talk about the ideals or models that your work considers. And so Aaron, I was um, reading back uh, through your statement that you have in Nueva Luz, and you mentioned this article. Um, it's called "Why It's Not Enough to Say Black Is Beautiful." And it's written by um, British Guyanese abstract painter Frank Bowling. And it states that the traditional Black aesthetic is pragmatic, uncluttered, direct, hinging on secrecy and disguise. Um, And I know also, um, actually, maybe we can go to the work with MacArthur Binion. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, another abstract painter, MacArthur Binion, um, has also influenced you. So I'd love to, in thinking about like the I the models or role models that our work considers, I would love to hear you talk about how black abstract painters and their ideas have influenced you. Yes, and I'm gonna try to keep it brief because I have a lot to say about this topic. I'm actually gonna post a link in the chat. Um, and it's an article, um, a recent article within the last two days about Frank Bowling. Uh-huh. And he wrote this article way back in, he wrote that article, It's Not Enough to Say Black is Beautiful back in 1971. And so this is artists coming right off of the cuff of the black arts movement, kind of right in the middle of it as it was sort of ending. And it, the work um, that it's not enough to say black is beautiful is detailing five black artists that in for show that he curated. They're all male artists and they're working within abstraction. And so um, 
part of the question in my work was like, if someone walks into a gallery and sees my work, will they ask, is this a black artist? Will they assume that this is a black artist? Or will they just say, who is the artist? Or, or what's this work about? Um, and so a lot of what those artists were dealing with and a lot of what that 1971 article was dealing with was this refusal of certain black artists to adhere to uh, didactic work, um, sort of a figurative black um, aesthetic. They, they were color filled, they are, they are and, and were color filled because some of them are deceased now, but color filled painters, um, assemblage in the studio. If you look at Melvin Edwards lynching fragments, nothing about them really suggests lynching is except that they hang off the wall. It's just metal fragments all welded together. But he's still talking about the current events of the time. He's still talking about black existence. And that article also brings up the fact that all the way back in 1971, even uh, the black experience cannot be defined, is not monolithic. Um, it, you can't get into these assumptions of, of what blackness is because it's, it's, it's people come at it from so many different spec perspectives and come at, come at it from so many different, different backgrounds. Also within that, um, that, that at this black abstract artist conversation and, and the role models sort of that I look to again, like I mentioned earlier, uh, these artists have been working in this way for 40 plus years, 30 plus years in some cases. And um, even Howard Dina Pendale is another major <laughs> figure. I think it's a big show opening up this week or sometime this month, or it may already be open. Mm -hmm. um, she used to work at the Museum of Modern Art. And she, um, I forget what her official position was, but she used to get flack from both sides. The predominantly white uh, crowd in that museum space did not want her there. And then also on the flip side of that, her fellow black artists were mad that she was not making figurative work. And also that she was not necessarily opening the doors for them. They wanted her to sort of say, oh, you work at the uh, MoMA, get us in there. Um, but that's, that wasn't her intent. And there's a whole backstory about it. And she talks about it in a recent article um, that was published, I think, October 16th, uh, last month. So uh, it's, it's a good read. And even Howard, Howard Dina Pendale's like her circle work. She does these works where she puts numbers on circles and she fills the whole canvas with circles. She makes circle shaped canvases and works. Um, but that's all from this experience. She went up to a food counter with her dad mm -hmm. um, in the 1960s. No, had to be earlier than that. But it's this childhood memory that she has that she can't get it out of her head. She asked her father, why are the utensils and the cups that we are using have circles on them? And her dad explains, these are the utensils and cups that are okay for colored people to use at this food stand. And so uh, Howardina Pendale is still make, is making this fully abstract work to where you can't really say, oh, this is a black artist who made this, or um, this uh, work is depicting figurative blackness, uh, black figures, but it still is talking about a her black experience because it's derived all the way from her childhood dealing specifically with segregation and probably one of the first moments in her life that she understands this difference like i'm different from other people um in this nation in this country so uh stories like that go on and on and all of these artists that were um that frank bolin is writing about in in in, in the um in the article uh, their works are fully abstract, but they are speaking to the Black experience. People's mm -hmm. perception was that you're not supporting the cause. You're, you're making white art. Um, and even some of them were, were told, you know, go uptown in the 70s at the time, go uptown and show with them. <laughs> but then they, they weren't accepted by that crowd either. So these artists kind of found themselves in limbo um, for so long and now. Now um, they're getting all this recognition and um, finally being represented by galleries, um, you know, going on 30 and 40 years. Uh, and it's that, that in itself, the, the fact that they've stayed dedicated to their cause this long and never deviated from it means a lot to me. 
Um, and that's why I constantly try to absorb as much as I can about that. Um, and, and people are still writing about it. It's still a lot we don't know and still a lot that has not just, you know, been recorded in history. And I'm, I'm, I'm very obsessed with it in the best way to sort of, you know, say, hey, these, they're my contemporaries. They're still working. They're still making. Um, I'm, uh, how do I contend with this, with, with, with this, this topic as well? Because um, that sentiment still sort of exists um, in, in various different ways in present day. So before I keep rambling, I'm going to stop. No, and no, Aaron, <laughs> I want to just follow up. How did you um, decide to pay homage to MacArthur Binion in this work, which I believe is overlaying like multiple shots um, of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, including, I believe, a mug shot? Somewhere. Yeah, uh, MacArthur is, MacArthur Binion is very important because, you know, I watched this little short video clip of him and he talked about his process of how he, how he paints in grids. He paints with oil stick and he, he paints with crayon. Um, there's this one painting, he takes his birth certificate from the state of Mississippi and he creates these um, redacted grids over it and then you zoom out and it's this whole geometric shape. But if you get close to it and look at the details, you can see the redacted information in his details from his uh, birth certificate in, in the state of Mississippi. He's from the Mississippi Delta. He talks about this idea of, of a labor and painting, making a painting that maybe only a black painter could make through those specific uh, experiences that he, 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 he grew up in and experienced um, in his upbringing in the Mississippi Delta. I'm from the Arkansas Delta. Um, and so I immediately felt the connection before I even read about that part. I saw his work, didn't know who he was. I just ref ref responded to the abstraction in the work. Um, and then I went down the rabbit hole of, of what he was doing. But even him in the 70s making work, um, people were kind of like, what are you doing? And he found himself in a position of like uh, not making figurative work, uh, not make, uh, working in acrylic or oil paint. Um, in terms of the traditional sense at that time period, and, and, and he was sort of left out of the uh, conversation as well until now. He just had a show. Um, I think it's still up. Forgive if, if it's in New York or in Chicago, but he has a show up right now, and um, that's a, some pretty good interviews um, of him up. And, but yeah, he's, he's been doing it for, for years and years and hasn't stopped. Um, and it's just so inspiring, and I'm just so um, drawn to the work. Um, and I think it, it butts up against that idea again as, as uh, the black experience is not a monolith. It's, 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 it's multiple um, viewpoints and multiple ways of approaching art. Um, um, so yeah, I hope that explains that. Uh, but yeah, this, that, this pattern so is sort of borrowed from MacArthur Binion. So I made the four by five negative, scanned it, made this grid and Photoshop, overlaid it, uh, to sort of abstract Martin Luther King and Malcolm X because um, there's a diptych that shows um, Martin Luther King's uh, mugshot and then Malcolm X's mugshot but I sort of tried to um, um, abstract the figures to make them unrecognizable because um, early on in this black alchemy work I, I was told that uh, my work was uh, too too much of a quick read um, that I was using uh, figures like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. People were going to look at the work and have this quick read and not want to engage with it. So this is my attempt to sort of put up a barrier uh, and, and, and sort of a test out to see if that would make people engage with the work more or not. Um, so there's just different things, absorbing things and different strategies, you know, as an artist in the studio formally. So let me stop rambling. <laughs> yeah, no, not at all. Thank you so much, Erin. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, Erica, I'd love to, to turn to your work and thinking about models and ideals. And I'm really curious about the fact that you have a background in clinical psychology and sociology. And in your series, Umbral, I definitely see kind of like this, maybe like psychological darkness and not these happy-go-lucky family portraits. So I'm really curious about maybe how some of the architects or ideas that were presented to you in these studies have influenced um, how you ap 
approach, you know, portraiture of, you know, family. Yeah, I, it took me a while to figure out that I was an artist. <laughs> Many student loans later <laughs> um, in other careers, then I kind of landed where I needed to be. So it took a while, but I don't think it was in vain, those previous studies. I think they enriched my work in a particular way. You know, with uh, studying psychology, um, I immediately go for kind of like the substance subtext of the image what is it trying to tell me how how do i connect it with my own history and i think photography as a whole how it relates to like psychology i really use it as a tool to understand my family history or understand my identity uh deeply um so that's one way that it has influenced and also with sociology which was what i did my first master's in um i think it is represented somehow in my previous work the one i did about my father because i started in speaking about his disappearance um, in that kind of micro story to look at larger structures in society especially in caribbean society or in my country where there's such corruption and these kind of crimes go, you know, cold and um, it, there's great impunity with this uh, kind of things that happen and also how normalized uh, violence towards women is or um, a sort of like the little instances where sexual abuse happens in society in a micro level. So I started to look at that in that work. So I think that is one way this study is kind of like uh, funneled in. And um, in terms of like ideals and the in ways of making work, um, I think I'm really drawn to uh, strong women who are looking at their experiences very directly. Um, I really, really love Francesca Woodman's uh, self-portraiture work because for me, I think she represented this kind of like in body, out of body experience that I was really fascinated by and very inspired. How can you um, uh, talk about something that is not in the room with the image itself? Or also how do you place the self within the image? Um, this sort of like evaluation of oneself. And uh, I also like when uh, self portraits, looking for example at Francesca Woodman, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, uh, Latoya Ruby Frazier yeah. and how they're both looking at each other's experience in a very different lens, um, how one is more like sociological and, and sort of talking about larger structure and the decay in society and how that is represented in the home um, and how the other one is also talking about decay, but, you know, mental decay. So these kind of ways of making work, women making work and looking at their experience and their surroundings have really shaped the way that I try um, to make work and they're like, to me, ideals to uh, sort of follow or be inspired by. Thank you. And then last I'll turn to Antonio. Um, so in your series, Fragments of the Masculine, you really do show us a spectrum of masculinity, um, you know, reflecting on the men in your family, um, a culture of machismo, but then also masculinity and queerness and in queer culture. So I'd love to hear you speak about um, the models and ideals that um, you're tackling or aspiring to in your work. Yeah, um, so for me growing up, um, I grew up in the housing projects here in, in Brooklyn, New York. Um, it, I think growing up in that, in that neighborhood, growing up in, um, growing up in the projects, like it has informed a lot of my perspective and how I see the world. Um, growing up with that sense of diversity um, really shaped um, it informed me, I think. Uh, um, on top of that, sort of dealing with that narrative of being queer and coming to grips with that and um, discovering the ballroom scene in New York City, um, that was something. And when I mean ballroom, I don't know, some people may think traditional ballroom, I mean sort of underground, Paris is burning, 
ballroom scene um, and really discovering that and um, how uh, finding my place there and, and, and seeing that there it was a home and a safe haven for for everyone but really specifically for black and latinx um individuals who were you know that felt like they didn't they didn't have a place you know they were just disowned by their own families and and looking at that history very carefully too um i think that really helped shape my perspective um and i grew up just really enamored with uh just i wouldn't say i can't say that i was looking at artists you know well-known artists i was always fascinated by um street artists and like when i go to los campos de you know colombia or dominican republic like seeing local artistry has always been something that's really been um more of an influence in seeing um unintentional art made is always something that grabs my attention mm-hmm. um and in terms of the the themes that i discussed in this work yeah it, it really does go back to um this battle between my you know two cultures that i um i i had to separate for a very long time in terms of my identity um and the fact that now this work in a way works as a way to resolve that and to bridge the gap between the two. Um, and a lot of that comes from my experiences coming out and and having to live two lives, you know, going 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 to the balls, going, to, you know, um, and, and, and seeing that culture, learning about um, art houses, um, what well, houses in the ballroom scene. And, and then later on, I, you know, having my own art house, um, a collective, a community of like, you know, diverse artists who um, are all supportive of each other and like being considered a mother of that house. Um, um, is, is In that sense of family, the chosen family um, has really influenced um, a lot of my work now, um, in particular, these collages. So, a lot of it was looking at this notion of the chosen family and looking at the family that I was given and um, contextualizing what that all meant internally um, and having that conversation with myself through this work. So, um, yeah, I think for me, it was just a lot of my experiences. I can't, you know, and, and this idea of, you know, taking back the Latinx narrative, having these difficult conversations within our communities about outdated ideologies. Um, uh, This idea that the man, uh, the Latino man has to be a certain way, um, has to live up to a certain blueprint and and, and really examining what that's led to, the type of misogynistic behavior that that leads to and like, and having those discussions. Um, Also acknowledging that like, I, I look at my father and he has some machismo qualities, but they're, I think that they're, a lot of them were predominantly more on the positive side, you know, this sense of honor um, and and loyalty and, and respect. Um, but, you know, he's had to unpack a lot of conditioning from his culture. And I think that's where my work, um, I think that's what ultimately what I want to do with my work and where it's informed is about unpacking conditioning. Um, cause we're all, con- you know, we're all conditioned in a certain, you know, in a certain way from our upbringings. And for me, it's like looking at the culture and unpacking our conditionings in certain aspects. Um, not everything. Cause I mean, I love being Latinx. I love mi cultura, but you know, there's, we need to have difficult conversations. I think some of the, um, what's happening now politically, if you see what happened in Florida and, you know, you're this idea of grouping Latinos all in one context is is not a viable thing. Um, <laughs> Latino Latinx identity is is complex. There's so many layers to it. So I think it's you know, but we as a, as a community at large, we have not had these discussions 
and and there are, there's a lot of pushback still to these discussions. So I think what I want to achieve with my work and like sort of the modes that influence it is about creating teachable moments, um, taking a moment for empathy and compassion and understanding, and and hopefully this artwork um, it serves as a doorway to that um, in in talking about it. Um, so I think that's you know that's. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting something. Sorry, I'm still, still a little bit under the weather. But like, <laughs> there's a lot that influences the work. But I think now, as I'm sitting here reflecting on everything that's happening right now, I think that those are really the major components that come to mind. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Antonio. Um, I, I just want to um, thank you and thank Stephanie for um, asking this last question because um, it will resonate with me, the unpacking conditioning. And um, as a word that kind of like summarizes where to move forward and where to kind of like break with all these um, expectations that were set up, I, I don't know how or why, but we have proven and, 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 and approved that um, not all can conform to, to, to those. And I, I, wanna, I wanna close this conversation by saying that I take a couple of things or many things from this conversation, which is the, the memory, the archives, the family, the, but also I, I see rebellion as a, you know, it's funny that we have the work of Damaris Alvarez in the middle of the room as a rebellion thing, but also to kind of like not conform to those expectations is something that I see as a, as a, as a consistent thread in the work. I see that in the work of Erika, where she doesn't conform to that idea of the traditional uh, family, where family can be many things. It could be chosen. It could be the given one. It could be, you know, I grew up with my grandmother and I had a mother and father that I love, but for some reasons I, li I live with, with my grandmother. And to me, that was a normal thing of a family, the common thing. I will say that with the work of um, Adam, for instance, there's nothing that says that abstraction cannot be a, a way of communicating or making our work and responding to that, and it connects to an essay that um, Stephanie shared with me this week from Bell Hooks that I think is called on role model or or something of that. I can't remember the, the the title, but I was I was taken by 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 aesthetics, by beauty, and why what art is created. And with Antonio has to do with how he how he's presenting himself in a very masculine way and how that part of being a, a queer Latinx man is how he presents himself as a man. So um, before we wrap up this uh, wonderful conversation, I just wanna ask if you have any questions for each other. Um, and I'm gonna mute myself to let you ask those questions for each other. Um, so I was just, I mean, really, thank you. This was amazing. You are all, I mean, I love it. I've been with your work, uh, now at the museum for a few months and, um, and seen people interacting with it. We've also had programs where, uh, uh other artists have been interacting with, um, classes. I know like, for instance, Erica actually, did, visited a class, uh, a, an English uh, uh, women in lit class. And the thing is, is like, I feel like so often, you know, museums, organizations, institutions, um, uh, people outside when we, when there's shows like Dos Mundos, they're like, oh, this is like about representation or something, which is like, it's not really the case. Um, it's an opportunity to serve the audience uh, that exists here, right? And that's why I think this, it's so important that this show is going to these university galleries because the students getting to see how you're all grappling with things that they grapple with, right? It, it is, I don't know, like I was talking to Bill Aguado yesterday and he was like, oh, is it gonna, you know, I hope we get all of this national art press and that it you know it, it's this big hit in the art world and and the thing that i was like i was like bill like i mean that's i agree like it deserves that but it's also like i measure impact um not by like 
you know, whether or not something ended up in the New York Times or whether or not something uh, uh, moves on and goes to MoMA or something, but it's really about the audience interaction, like who's seeing it, who's it made for, and is that person that it's made for seeing it, you know, are they engaging with it? And I think that, um, anyways, I don't know, I was just, it's just something that, especially like hearing like you all talk about how you're, um, you know, the uh, challenging, one challenging the idea that like a culture is a monolith, um, but two also like addressing like, you know, the problems that you in, as individuals navigated in your own culture, right? Um, and that we all do as individuals, right? Like everybody can relate to that to a degree. Like, yeah, I grew up in Texas, uh, also gay, like, and that in and of itself, right? Like I had to like navigate what Texas was as a gay boy. Um, and so I don't know what I'm saying other than that. I think it's right that it's in a university art museum. Uh, uh, I, and, and it's so good that it's traveling to others because we've got that built in audience of young, young people um, who are at that point in their lives where they're forming their identity and they need to hear voices that they can find themselves reflected in. I agree so much with what you're saying. I'm just gonna say something really quickly. I It resonated to me a lot what you're saying. Well, you can't really measure the work uh, with the fact that it, it comes out in the New York Times or the press that it has because, you know, if I were like to make books only so they are published by Aperture, I, I never make work. Or if I am only thinking like, when am I gonna get like a solo, uh, be represented by like this gallery in New York City? Like, that's not the point. I think that also um, understanding that the privilege that is around those spaces and how sometimes like whatever work we're making, is that our audience? How does that fit? That's something that I keep asking myself, like who's my audience? Um, and uh, I get a lot of satisfaction from just having conversations with people and kind of like opening up a dialogue um, and not necessarily like the huge, big achievements. Not that they're not great, but you know, it's, it's not the standard. The point is making the work and going through that struggle and somehow engaging in conversation with someone else. Um, so that resonated with me, what you're saying. Um, it should be that the goal just isn't the, the base, you know, it isn't that, it's like, part of me thinks it's not like that some people need into a, a certain location, but that location just, it has too much power and it doesn't need to have that power anymore. Sorry. Um, yeah, no, just to build on what you're saying, um, I, I agree with what, what was said, but I also want to add that um, one, as much as it's more than just a show about representation, um, the representation matters. Um, that component of the show is so crucial because a lot of these students, um, when I've tried, I remember doing a talk earlier this year at a show where I had like a prestigious, very, very white history institution in Massachusetts that um, they were wonderful, great hosts, wonderful, but they were just doing the work in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion initiative. Like they were really trying to, you know, and thankfully I had a colleague there who brought me on, did an artist talk, but these kids who were of color there felt seen, you know, like me talking about these, these issues and my experiences and like growing up in New York and like all that, and like um, it was important. So I think representation is so crucial. But I think often we as people of color and artists of color are always, um, it, it shouldn't be about the big accolades, of course, it's about making the work. However, I do say that I feel like we shouldn't accept the, um, the, the bare minimum. Um, I think that we should be accepting our roses while we're doing the work, you know? Um, and we should get that recognition just like our white contemporaries have for quite a long time. Um, so as much as I think that it's not necessarily about that, I think that we as people of color need to stop conditioning ourselves to thinking that the bare minimum is all right, um, that that's a-okay and that's, we'll just accept that. Um, I'm personally, I have built my career in 
fighting against, I mean, just really <laughs> um, fighting with, with this lens of like diversity, equity, and inclusion. I work in arts education and, and arts education programming and applying a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens on all the work that I do. And then that of course translates into my personal artwork, but like um, I, it took me a long time to, to unpack that, to unpack that idea of like, you know, I, as a person of color, as a child of immigrant parents, have been taught to work through trauma, and we and 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 what we've learned about the, the current social political movement is that the black community has been conditioned in that way for so long to work through trauma, and now it's like no, it's like they you know they and so many other people of color, like other communities of color deserve to get their roses as not after <laughs> they've gone and the new generation comes and takes their place and does the work. Why can't we get our roses while we're here doing the work now? So I think that's my mentality is, you know, so completely like I agree with you say, but you know, it's 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 been something that I've I've learned to to unpack um in recent years. So just wanted maybe to piggyback off of that Antonio, I'm also thinking about like how can we as artists and art administrators of color be in multiple spaces, right? And really show up with all of our, all of our diversity, right? How can we express ourselves in all the different forms that we want? Um, just really showing that we are not a monolith, really showing all of our nuances, you know, being loud when we want to be loud, being quiet when we want to be quiet. Um, and thank you, Antonio. We are nearing the two hour mark. So I just want to check in and see if there are any last questions. Also, Melinda, Ron, if you have any questions, feel free to um, share them. I actually have a question for Aaron. I was wondering if he is, since his work incorporates, um, I actually have two questions. Since your work incorporates like historical figures who were in a social justice movement before it was called social justice, mm -hmm. uh, it was like civil rights. Um, are you incorporating any of the contemporary figures who are involved in social justice into your work? Very That's good. one question. The second question is, why do you feel a need to photograph your, your, your you're making like collages and sculptural work but you're presenting them as photographs. Why not present them as collages and sculptures and leave photography completely out of the equation? Those are long questions, forgive me. Uh -huh. Well, to answer the last one first, um, I deal with that in the studio every day that I enter it, um, <laughs> every day. Uh, why am I using a photograph? Why am I using a camera? Um, <laughs> And I actually, in my studio right now, I'm working on um, two paintings um, because sometimes the, the, the photograph is so limiting. Um, so I moved, I move and bounce around to other, to other um, mediums. And, you know, when I'm, when I'm making, I am making these collages and installations in, 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 in the studio. And it's kind of just sort of documenting my time in the studio, really. It's documenting these installations. Um, because as soon as I get that image, I break it down and I mm -hmm. put up another one. And then I photograph that, I break it down, I put up another one um, like that. And so I feel like with all the Black alchemies, uh, I've done volume one, two, and three, it's creating my own archive. And what I'm thinking about now is how, how is it presented? Um, I'm exploring things like virtual reality. What does it mean for someone to walk around in one of these installations that I photograph, going from a 2D compressed space back into the 3D space? Um, I'm just moving very slow at it. But those are things that I'm thinking about and, and actively working through in the studio. It's, it's something that I ask myself um, uh, every day in the studio and it's a challenge to work through, but it's exciting. That's what makes being an artist exciting because you get to, to sort of like work through all these ideas and say, what if, what if I put all this together and leave this out or add this and multiply that, uh, what do you get? And then to answer that first question about 
uh, the past social justice movements, the civil rights movement. Um, I love that that period of history. I mean, I love it. Um, and it's for the simple fact that, you know, I grew up in, uh, in this town called West Memphis, Arkansas, in, in, in the Arkansas Delta. And I was in, um, and maybe this is not a unique situation, maybe to generation, maybe to the, the students now that are sort of in middle school and high school. But when I was in middle school and kindergarten, um, my kindergarten teacher already had my brother <laughs> before I got to the class. And then there were teachers who were already, my oldest brother is 10 years older than me. And then I have a middle brother. We're only 15 months apart, but I had even cases where teachers had taught all three of us, plus my parents, plus all my aunts and uncles and cousins <laughs> too. So I, the fact that I walked into the room, I couldn't get away from anything by my last name. They already knew who my family was and there was a certain expectation of me. And I grew up in this era where, you know, when Black History Month came around, you know, if you didn't know who George Washington Carver was or if you couldn't uh, tell the story of um, all these other different figures, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, like you were scolded by the teacher. Um, and you had to know it. You had to know your history. You had to put your best foot forward and um, have a pride in that. And so that's where my attachment to that. I love the, um, the story of how the civil rights movement sort of came to be. You had, you know, African-American soldiers serving in World War II in this double V campaign, double victory. You had to get victory abroad and then they had to come back and get fight vic victory here. Uh, they were seen with the uniforms on and they were attacked. Um, that it was not accepted. Um, kind of like how the military service now is seen as this big, um, you know, pedestal that people get put on. But then I have family members who um, went through the military service and came out alcoholics and addicts and uh, have all these different problems as a result of military service. Even people being exposed to Agent o Orange, different family members who served in Korean War and Vietnam War and different stuff like that. So it's put on this pedestal, but then there's all these uh, negative things attached to it as well. And uh, to answer the, 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 the part of the question that you posed, I do have an image of Colin Kaepernick. Um, I typically do not work in the present with my work because I feel like so much of the past is unreconciled. Uh, we gotta go back and really examine the civil rights movement and everything surrounding it. Uh, if, we, if, if society really had truly dealt with it, we wouldn't even be where we are now. That's my thought on it. Um, but I did, when the whole Colin Kaepernick thing happened, uh, it kind of died down. And then in 2018, it kind of picked back up. I got tired of hearing about it. And so I made work to reflect on it. Um, but then I had to go back and make a whole other set of work to go with that. I had to look at um, John Carlos, who raised his fist on the, um, on the Olympic podium, Muhammad Ali protested the Syracuse eight protested and then they were in the 1970s and then they were blackballed from the NFL before Colin Kaepernick ever was blackballed. And then you have, um, I think it's Mahmoud um, Abdul Raf was a basketball player in the 1990s. Yeah. Uh, he was of Muslim faith, uh, Islamic faith. And he um, didn't want to stand for the, uh, the, the singing of the national anthem. He would sit um, and then they came to a compromise that he could stand in this posture and pray as the national anthem was being played. But then, you know, this was a guy that was playing in Michael Jordan's era and was just, was just as good as Michael Jordan. He put up big numbers against Michael Jordan every time they played the Bulls. He played for the Denver Nuggets. But then he was traded after this 1996 season. And then at the age of 30, he had no career anymore. Yeah. So we got to go back and examine all of that before we even get to Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is why I can constantly stay in the past and, and kind of because of that upbringing and kind of this pride that I was expected to have. Uh, that's just kind of where I live. <laughs> thank you. Way. Thank you for that answer. And thank you for those questions. I really appreciate it. Aaron, quickly, because um, I get this question a lot about my work in terms of why do I stay with photography? Um, I, just to speak on that with you, like I, I usually like my philosophy towards it now is like, I'm building my own archive by recontextualizing um, an older archive. And like, that's sort of why I stay in it. And it took me a while to understand that, like why I stayed within that mode of photography. Um, 
that's I think I resonate so much with your work, Aaron, and like what you were saying. So I just wanted to touch on that because I like I often deal with that question, and it's like that mode of like creating like um, it's hard to sometimes articulate to people who may not understand. Well, why not? Because I I never keep the the actual collages, so they do become a documentation of that experimenting in that moment. Um, so thank you for sharing that. I thought that was really important. So I just wanted to. I'm so glad you, you brought that up, Antonio. Thank you for mentioning that. And like, I had a question prepared. I wrote out this question. I just want to read it. Y'all don't have to answer it, but I know because we get into the end, but it deals directly with that. I was like, my, I just read it. It's like my question for Antonio and Erica both is, um, you know, we all use photography to speak about identity but what do you all find most frustrating uh, with the medium at times? Um, like it's two dimensional and, and sometimes in some cases it's limited and, and getting the message across that we want. But on the flip side of that, what is it? Uh, what is the thing that keeps you coming back to it? The thing that is most satisfying about um, uh, it, it and speaking to uh, representation and identity. That was the question that I had prepared to like ask to you all as the, fellow artists, I just want to read it and have it on record, but, um, it, you know, we're, we're sort of on the same page there, Antonio. Thank you. I think for I'll me, just add, oh, oh, sorry, no, you no. go, no, you go, I already spoke, you go. Mm. No, I think for me, uh, what I love about photography is also the frustrating aspect of it, which is this idea of truth, like, if it serves as a real document, is this like a real document of what's happening? How sometimes when you take an image and you have an intention with it, the image ends up becoming something else or is interpreted in many different ways. Um, and that sometimes can be frustrating when you're trying to express something and, and you can't really get at it through the image. Like you might need other resources, text or you know, other recontextualization or like other mediums, a book or something. But I think that same frustration is also the powerful aspect of photography. Uh, for example, I like working a lot with found imagery and how in found imagery or in vernacular photography, how you can imbue an image that is not your own with a different narrative, how you can kind of like insert a narrative or use that as a way to carry another meaning that is not necessarily what was the meaning of when the photo was taken. So this kind of like line between fiction and reality of what's happening when the image is being taken and, and the idea of truth, if, if it's a truthful document, I think that's what that's what fascinates me and keeps me engaged with the, the malleability of it. And also images that are your own, images that are someone else's, um, the collaboration of it is just really ripe for um, a lot of different avenues of working, so. Yeah, I mean, just to add to that for me, um, it's really what keeps me the key photography part of my process is um, this idea of like creating my own archive. Um, I, I like to often imagine what people will do, what generations will do after me with the work I leave behind. Like, will they then recontextualize it into something new? Um, it's, it, it for me is, I think this notion of, um, truth in photography is a complicated one for me. I, I, I think that there's there's many versions of truths in photography, uh, which is always an interesting and complex um, thing to grapple with. Um, but, I, but ultimately I think what, like for me, what can be frustrating about photography is not that it's limiting, but I feel like um, that sometimes there are people within the photographic field that like, can't expand their imagination as to what photography can be and how it can be reimagined and transformed and, 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 and recontextualized in different ways, whether that be in a space, um, whether it be um, via presentation or practices and approaches to image making. Um, I think that that for me is the most frustrating when I deal with like, I call them the purest, you know, the, the ones that feel like 
I have, you know, the D8 9000, whatever, 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 and, uh, you know, the biggest, fanciest, newest lens, and they think that that's what makes them a photographer, and um, so infuriating. Um, <laughs> but um, but I also, I don't know, it's it's weird, even though I haven't been in the darkroom in a while, um, I, 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 every time I see an image printed or, or, or is something being adhered, now I'm printing on different surfaces, um, I still get that feeling of um, in the dark room, the chemicals. It just somehow takes me back to that feeling um, of being in a black and white and a color dark room, and like, and just yeah, that moment. I don't know. I still get that that feeling, that sensation. So like, um, once that stops, <laughs> if that ever does, hopefully it doesn't, then I'll re-examine my practice. But I think as long as I still feel that. Um, I think photography will continue to be part of my practice and um, and just sorry just to wrap it up if, on my end um, I think also for me as like growing up in the projects and in terms of accessibility like an actual like analog camera was not something that was always accessible to me my mom had to work overtime in a laundromat to like afford my first camera my first analog camera like it was not something that we that was like a lavish thing to have. Like it was a big deal to have um, growing up. Um, but she believed enough in my passions to invest in it. So um, I think it's the fact that I fell in love with it because it wasn't something that, it felt like it wasn't supposed to be accessible to people like me. And so I, I think in a weird way that helped shape my love for photography is being able to have access to it and being fortunate enough to have a, to you know to have my mom who, who who worked her ass off to make sure that I had that accessibility so it's yeah so that's that's if that's it for me I'll shut up there. <laughs> Karen, do you have uh, an answer to that question? What frustrates you most and keeps you in it? Oh my goodness, I don't know. I think Erica and uh, Antonio did it justice, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of the, the similar things, just like you know. I'm always faced with the limitations of it, but then I'm also, I get so excited about, you know, how do we create something new out of this? And that's why I love abstraction so much um, and kind of telling off of just what Antonio was saying and also Erica, um, like just having a love for those uh, chemicals and working in the dark room. And then um, just just the, the joy of, of making an image. Um, you know, we as artists of color have a right to make work in that vein. If it's just about the enjoyment of the medium of photography, uh, we have that right um, to make work about that. And if we want to make identity work about identity or representation the next day, we have that right too. Uh, so that's my whole outlook on that. And I encourage everyone to read up on um, David Hammonds because this whole situation about uh, <laughs> notoriety and um, uh, you know how you maneuver the art world and flip it on its head. I mean, you got David Hammonds who's telling uh, the Whitney Museum, no, I don't want to be in your buying room. Uh, MoMA, no, you can't have a retrospective of my work. So those type of uh, uh, gestures as an artist is so powerful. And uh, uh, I, I've been, um, last four weeks, uh, me and my class have been talking about David Hammonds and um, it's just been so eye-opening and uh, our artists, I encourage everyone to just, just uh, engage with every now and again. So <laughs> that's what I'll uh, end right there. Thank you all. Thank you, Erica. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, our audience. Thank you, Dorsky and Foco and Juanita, co-curator. Yeah, thanks. Thanks to the artists. Thanks to the curators. Thanks to uh, Ron and the rest of the staff over at Enfoco. Um, this has been really, this has been great. It's made the day even better for me. Uh -huh. It was a real pleasure. There's nothing like hearing artists talk about their works. I, I have the best job in the world. Yeah, <laughs> so, totally. <laughs> <laughs> not even a job. My son is like, you have too much fun working. I know <laughs> I do. <laughs> Well, it should be, right? No, thank you guys for the opportunity to um, reflect on on our practice. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And just for the opportunity of being in a space with um, so many wonderful artists that inspire me and that, 
you know, make me ask different questions and uh, thank you and let's celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much, for Stephanie and Juanita. Thank you guys so much. Antonio and congratulations. Thanks everybody. To, thank you. to see you both makes me feel seen. I love you guys. Thank you so much. <laughs> to see you all, to see you all. But yeah, that's, yeah. we need more POC and female curators in the game. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Antonio, you should celebrate with some arepas. Just saying. I <laughs> mira. <laughs> Mira, yo me voy a buscar una cervecita, una arepa, y ya, olvídate. Thank you guys so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.